Thank you, Kyle. Good evening, everybody. Before I, I start us off, I'd like to first welcome our New York State PTA president, Dana Platten. If, uh, Dana, if you don't mind saying a few words. And Rob, I think Dana's still trying to get in. So I'll let you know she's having a bit of struggle. Um, I see her trying to get in. So when she gets in, uh, I'll let Sonny to turn it right over to her, but we can move forward. Okay, thank you, Kyle. All right, so nine years ago, Sonia agreed to be an elementary PTA unit president with no prior PTA experience. Ever since, she has been actively participating in conventions and training provided by national, state, and regional PTAs. Sonia has been a unit president for two elementary and one middle school units, as well as unit treasurer, membership chair. She has held numerous positions on the region PTA board that culminated into being appointed for the Genesee Valley Region Region Director by New York State PTA in May of 2019. Sonia is a mother of two boys, ages 12 and 14. She loves technology, as you'll see, and showing people how to actively engage and communicate with PTA members using a wide variety of methods. Sonia lives with her family in Rochester. I'd like to welcome Sonia. Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I'm so excited uh, to be here. Kyle, you're going to let me know when uh, our president, Dana Platten, gets in, right? And our president is just uh, joined us, which is fantastic. I know awesome. she's uh, on mute, but Dana, if you could unmute yourself. Can I have. I'm sorry about that, Sonia. Of all nights, this is the tech toolkit. <laughs> and my friend here knows that I am very tech unsavvy. And so I've been working on getting in for a few minutes. I would have been timely had I not had so much trouble. So here I am and um, hello everybody. Hi, I, I also had trouble, so I apologize. It's great to be here. And I, I haven't yet seen um, the attendance lift. I was just about to check in and ch check on the chat. Um, but for those of you who are tuning in, you will learn so much tonight because Sonia is our tech guru. She's really phenomenal. She's fantastic. She loves this. She's passionate about it. And stay tuned because you are going to learn a lot tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to stick around too because I have a lot to learn. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Sonia, and have a great uh, workshop. I know you're going to knock it right out of the park. Thank you. Thanks. So first of all, um, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a workshop that I presented at our um, 2019 state convention. Uh, so, so for some, from, so some of you that may have been around since then, you may have attended this workshop. Um, Amani and Rob are gonna, and Kyle are gonna take a look at the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and they will relay them to me verbally. Um, but I am also hoping maybe to use some of the meeting reactions and nonverbal feedback that I will be able to see. So um, stay tuned, stay tuned for that. So this workshop is actually um, an expansion of a workshop that I attended at the 2019 National Convention. And I do want to thank Naomi Frierson, who is the Florida State Member uh, uh, Chair. She originally gave this presentation and then I, I like doubled the number of tools um, that she presented because um, I, I use a lot of these tools in my day-to-day -day, uh, unit PTA life and I've brought them onto the region um, and some onto the state. So um, these are all tools that I actively use. And so I, um, I hope that you find them useful, especially in this time when we're doing so many things electronically and virtually. Um, I hope that they are, are a real asset uh, to your organization. Uh, okay, so list of items that I hope to cover. You do not need to take notes. Um, a PDF of all of these slides is gonna be posted on our New York State PTA website. And many of them have um, hyperlinks to the websites that I'm gonna be talking about that have more detailed information as far as help articles and things like that. So feel free to just um, you know, absorb like a sponge right now what you're, what you're listening and what you're seeing um, and, and post any questions you, you have in the chat. So we're gonna go over TechSoup Google Suite for nonprofits, a um, couple of online signup tools, Slack, Airtable, Zoom conferencing, Eventbrite, some social media tools, um, and some online fundraising platforms. Um, I was asked originally to also include MemberHub. As you know, MemberHub is a phenomenal tool that um, our New York State PTA 
has been using for the past four or five years. That um, actually requires its own workshop because as many of you know, it has a lot of features. Um, and I actually personally think it's one of the most robust platforms that New York State PTA has made available to units um, in the time that I've been involved in PTA. I'm very thankful for Member Hub. I use a lot of its functionality. Um, I regularly do an advanced Member Hub workshop um, and I, even that doesn't cover everything uh, that it does. So um, if you'd like more training on that, feel free to send an e email to the chat or put it in the chat that you want a Member Hub uh, webinar uh, put on the schedule and we, we can get that arranged for you, so. Okay, so TechSoup is a, is a nonprofit verification clearinghouse. Um, and what they do is they match uh, computer programs, uh, platform software with nonprofits. So um, what PTA units, I would encourage PTA units to do is to register with TechSoup. And once you register with TechSoup and they verify you as a 501c3 organization, then you can get discounted access to things like a nonprofit status for Zoom. You can get access to um, Google Suite for nonprofits, which is a free tool. Um, you can get, um, I'll, I'll show you some other things that you can get, but it's, it's a great, it's a verification. So it verifies you as a 501c3, which then unlocks some nonprofit pricing uh, to you for different technology services. So anything that you get through TechSoup um, is solely for the use of your PTA unit. So again, this would this is this is where you're looking at your PTA unit as a standalone organization that is going to outlive you as an officer, right? So you want to see it as its own, um, as its as its own organization. So anything that you get through here should be used solely for PTA use. Um, for example, as I mentioned, Google for nonprofits, you can get an Intuit QuickBooks Online Plus, a one-year subscription for up to five users for a $75 administration fee. Again, so you would pay the $75 administration fee and you would get the one-year online access to, to um, QuickBooks. You can get a Premier Edition, um, which is um, a desktop version for $60. You can get access to Zoom meetings for nonprofit for $65. So again, this just gives you access to uh, different platforms and softwares that you can get to use as a, as a nonprofit. Okay, so Google for nonprofits. So this offers um, Google products to nonprofits um, and you can get it for free. So you can get anything that you can get through Google, like the Gmail, you can get the Drive, the um, Docs, Slides, all that different stuff. With, um, with the domain, so you would tie it with the domain, you can get access to it for free for your organization. So you could be, um, for example, I, I'm right now, I'm treasurer of Martha Brown PTSA. So we have a mbptsa.org domain. And so we have emails that say, you know, president at mbptsa.com. We have vice president, we have treasurer at mbptsa.org, um, sorry. So um, G Suite for nonprofits is a tool that's available. This goes through the procedure. I, I spent a lot of time going through all the different help articles of how to step-by-step. Step. It is a multi-step process to get G Suite for nonprofit set up, but once you do it, it's set up kind of for life. Um, so you do need to purchase a domain, which is usually um, less than $20 a year. So anyway, but again, all these things are different hyperlinks on the, on the handout that you can take a look at. Um, so it includes Gmail, includes Drive, Calendar, Translate, Doc Sheets, Slides, and Forms. So let's go through these one by one kind of quickly. Actually, I'm going to use some of the meeting reactions. If you're familiar with Gmail, go ahead and click the Yes button. Okay, getting some numbers. Awesome. People are using it. Okay, so you can use Gmail two different ways. Thanks, everybody. You can stop reacting. Um, you can use it without a domain. So for example, like, um, you know, Martha Brown PTSA at gmail.com, right? That would be using it without a domain. So you could just have a generic email address um, or a generic Gmail account that would be used by, it would be accessible by mem all, all of the officers, right? 
um, or you could create it with a domain. So again, most domains are 16 to $20 a year. Um, I suggest if you're doing, if you're doing the Google for nonprofit program, just make it easy on yourself and you can get purchase the domain through Google. There's no need to go through, you can do GoDaddy and a whole bunch of other things, but why not just make it easy and just get it all through Google? So it'll make it a lot easier. You can decide if you want um, the accounts to be position, as I mentioned before, like president, vice president, secretary, treasurer at domain.org, or if you want it to go by the person. Um, and you can also set up aliases. So for example, I have um, the Martha Brown PTSA that I mentioned I was a part of. We set up the accounts with our individual names, but we have aliases set up as our um, officers. And the reason for that is so that way, if somebody is going to a new office, so if somebody does maybe their treasurer this year, I was president last year, I'm treasurer this year. So I had my, I kept my same Gmail account, but I changed my alias. So I was president at MBPTSA at mbptsa.org last year. This year, my alias is treasure at mbptsa.org, but my email account always stayed Sonia at mbptsa.org. The advantage of that is that you're not switching. I didn't lose my, my Gmail account. I didn't lose all the emails that I got last year. I kept them. I just changed the alias of the office that I was in. And when we publicize the email addresses, we publicize the aliases so that way people always know to go to email the alias, not the actual adult. But that's the decision that your board or your executive committee would have to make up and set up as a procedure, have it written down that this is the way the accounts are gonna be set up. Um, also, if you have a domain, you can also set up a group email like board at domain.org to automatically go to multiple people. Okay, so you can use it as a catch-all if you wanted to. Um, so you could have the generic email, um, and you can also, um, if you do have your domain at common inbox is a great way to collect emails, a central location. This is one of Naomi's slides. Sorry about this, but you could do it if, again, this is if you own the domain. So if you have it set up as the domain, you could have like, um, you know, officers or just generic or PTA at mbptsa.org. And so you could, you could have a generic inbox that maybe all officers have access to. It's just, an, it's just a different way of setting it up. Um, Gmail is a great, does have some great tools to keep your emails sorted. You can use folders. You can, um, you can add them with different labels of things. Like when they're done, you could put them in different conversations. So you could file your inbox messages um, by different topics that you needed to. So that's available to you as well. Okay, Drive. So Drive so is okay. sort of- One yes. second, uh, Amani, we do, and Rob, we do have a question in the chat box if you guys can uh, ask Sonia. Um, so oh, Amani, you may need to unmute. I think we lost Amani. Sorry, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> lost with the buttons. Here I am. <laughs> Uh, the question, Sonia, is would you be willing to share the written down procedures for the email account? Yeah, so all of these slides are, are, are going to be shared on the New York State PTA web, as website immediately following this um, event. And many of the, especially the, the things that I had hyperlinked on the slide are clickable. So people can click on them and it will take them to the correct um, article on the, for Google. And just so everyone who is home, this presentation and the recording will be shared um, on our website under leaders and then our leadership webinar series. So if you go to the website and you'll see a tab at the top that says leaders and then underneath there it says webinar series and that's where you will find this information. So this is great when you're watching the actual video again for reinforcement or sharing it with your colleagues on your PTA, but the PDF is great also because you can actually click on the links that you're asking for further information. So mm -hmm. Sonia was kind enough to put it in a PDF format where you can actually click on each link and follow the steps. So, yep. and again, if you have any questions, you can always um, ask, send us an email. Yep. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so Drive is sort of the new PTA binders. I know um, 
for many, many units have binders for each office and they pass the binder from one person to the other. Um, so Google Drive, you can think of as your digital PTA binder. So um, you can take, uh, create folders for every year. You could have a folder for the office and then you put stuff in that office. So you can just, and then you just add the drive uh, credentials, right? That go with that Google email account and the drive and all that stuff. You could pass that on to the next uh, officer and then they've got access to it. So you can also share folders um, in Google Drive with other people, both inside and outside of your organization. Um, and Google for Nonprofits includes a shared drive that is automatically shared with all users that are in your domain. And this can be uh, great for especially passing on previous years or archive materials. And the reason I say that is because um, shared drive files cannot be shared with outside users. Um, so you want, it's definitely more of an archive. I would use it as more of an archive functionality. Otherwise you'll get frustrated if you're trying to do it for current, because again, you wouldn't be able to share any materials that are in the shared drive with anybody outside your organization via a link. So if you wanted to do any of that sharing you about the current year information, you're better off doing it in the traditional my drive and using the shared drive for an, as an archive for anything that's um, passed. Um, so you can do different things in Drive where you have different folders um, is the example shown here. And then you can also share things um, with individual people. You could have just share via the link. Again, these are things that are only available in the My Drive functionality of Google Drive, not in the shared drive. And the other nice thing about when you're sharing things in Drive, as many of you may be aware, you can share, the, you can share whether or not they have the ability to edit or only comment or only view. So if it's a file you don't want anybody to change, you could set it as view only or comment only if you want them to be able to provide some feedback without changing the document itself. Okay, calendar. So many people are probably familiar with calendar. So you can color code events, you can share it publicly, you could link it, embed it on a web page, you can print files, you can share it, people can subscribe. Um, so calendar has a lot of different functionality um, that units can use to share events and to share it with people. Translate, this is sort of a, um, so you can add a Google translate button to your website and then um, it would be able to translate most of the text that's in your website um, to almost to any language. So you would just type in, I love, PTA, here's an example, then they wanted it translated into Spanish, and then it came back with AMO PTA. And Sonia, I'm just gonna interrupt on that yeah. slide. Just yep. as a reminder to all of our units online that we have the capabilities to translate your documents off right at the office. So if you need any help in translating documents, please reach out to the office. We can translate into 170 some languages for you which is an awesome service. And I'm so glad that you guys can provide that at the office. That's wonderful. Okay, so Google, again, continuing on the Google Docs, Sheets and Slides, oh my. So uh, how many people are familiar with Docs, Sheets and Slides? Can I get some uh, thumbs up or yeses if you're using it? Awesome. 13 plus six, one person says they're not using it. So, okay, good. Thank you. Okay, um, question for you, if I can yeah. interrupt. Yep. Uh, from Julie, we got G Suite, but we do most of the, most in member help. We're finding mm -hmm. uh, it's double entry to do both. So often one falls by the wayside. Is there a logic to which activities occur in which format? So basically how to balance. Google uh, with G Suite with? It kind of depends on what, um, and, and that is something that I think you as a, as a board have to decide, make a commitment to what platform is going to be your primary platform for the year. And then maybe have somebody designated as, you know, pulling it into the, you know, the, the drive for historical purposes, you know, that might be a way to do it. Um, but yeah, 
each unit kind of has to make that decision on their own. There's pro there's definitely pros and cons to each platform. So Member Hub has advantages. Google, you know, Drive has has advantages. So you just kind of have to weigh those on your own and decide what what features are most important to you and, and what people are comfortable with, because ultimately what's going to work is is what fits the culture and what fits the tech ability of your board right if people aren't using it then it's not it's not a good tool right it's only as good as 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 the amount of as the number of times that you're using it so um so google docs sheets and slides you can edit directly in drive and for that reason a lot of people like doing google drive because they collaborate on things together, right? Member Hub, you're pretty much saving a copy of it and then that people have to download it, right? So if you wanted to work on something collaboratively, um, doing it on docs, sheets, slides, you know, on the Google platform can be great because you can collaborate on things together. Everybody can look at things. You can edit things live in real time. Everybody sees the edits. Um, so that if, if that's something that is, you know, on a project basis, um, you could definitely do that. So, and then you could convert it. You could upload the final version to member hub, you know, that would be maybe a, a way of incorporating both of them. But again, it, it has to fit the culture of what the skills and the desires are of your officers, and the people that are doing the work that you're doing. Forms. Okay. So forms is like a psh right now, right? Everybody's using forms for a lot of different things. <laughs> We're using it for event registration for our New York State PTA LegCon coming up, right? So you can do it for quizzes. I see people, I've, I've got about 20 different virtual escape rooms that were created by libraries all over the country that are using Google Forms to create digital escape rooms. Um, you can use them for elections. We have a webinar coming up, I think it's next week on virtual election tools. Google Forms is gonna be one of the things we're gonna talk about that. So Google Forms can be used for a lot of different things. Um, and uh, and it, it, so you can set up the form, you can set up the questions, and then you can collect the data coming back from, you know, people fill it out. And then you get the data back as spreadsheets or charts or whatever, you know, whatever kind of, depending on the questions that you ask. So Forms is a really great tool that a lot of PTAs are using for a lot of different things. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that it was available and out there. Volunteer sign up. So again, Member Hub has volunteer signups. Um, it's got pros and cons. This uh, before Member Hub came around, I was doing volunteer signups. So online, um, two tools that I've used in the past are Signup Genius and Signup.com. Signup.com used to be Volunteer Spot, um, and to be honest, I have a preference for signup.com. I like the functionality of it a little bit easier. It's a little bit more intuitive. It's a little bit easier to understand. Signup Genius is also great. Um, so, but you can use them to create signups for either collecting items or, and collecting, you know, you need volunteers to do different things. So what the advantage of both of these platforms have over, over Member Hub is that anybody, you can just share a link and anybody can sign up. Um, in Member Hub, if you create a sign up in the Member Hub platform, only people that are in that Member Hub hub can view and sign up on the sign up. So if you're looking for if you're looking for like doing a eighth grade year end event and you want to get, you know, stuff from all the eighth grade or eighth grade parents, you know, having something that is can be more widely spread on, um, you know, via parent newsletter or your uh, email or whatever social media, um, it's gonna be a lot easier to share the link from signup.com or signup genius than it would be to share um, through member hub. So this is an example of a signup that we did. I did on signup.com. So this is what it looks like if you were a parent to go to it. You can see, um, you know, we were asking for cookies and water bottles, and you just put in how many of the different spots that you needed, and we had the quantities listed here, and then you could see how many people signed up, and we also were able to put time slots of needing actual people to volunteer on the sign up as well. So all that information um, was here on the sign up. And the other nice thing, like Member Hub does, is these platforms, you can set it up to send an automatic reminder a day day ahead of time, two days ahead of time. So it would send an automatic reminder to people. Okay, Slack. So this is um, another communication tool. 
Um, Member Hub is a great platform. Um, Slack was something that I actually started using with another non-for-profit that I was using. I've used it a little bit in my region board. Um, Slack is like email and text together. So um, if you're looking for, if you've got text messages over here and you've got emails over here um, and you want, and you've got Facebook messenger over here and you're trying to get to the point where you want everybody to only work on one platform, um, Slack can be that collaborative platform. So, but it only, it works because that what you say, we're only using Slack to collaborate. They have mobile um, app so you can get on Slack easily on your mobile device. You can access it on the computer. You can access it on a tablet. Um, and what Slack does is it uses channels um, like topics for conversations. So, and you can have unlimited number of private or public channels. Um, everything is searchable and on the, they have different platforms. They have a free plan and they also have plans that you can pay for. Um, you get more tools for as you pay for them. But even in the free plan, the most recent 10,000 um, things are, are searchable. So this is an example of um, on our region uh, PTA site. So this is an example of different channels that we have listed. So I have different channels for our diversity event, our newsletter, region meetings. One of the things that I like about Slack is you can um, you can link it to like my Google Drive so I could add attachments. And then what I like is I can open these straight from here. So I can click on this link. Um, this is just a slide, so I'm not going to click on it right now. But I could, if I clicked on this icon that said GVPTA board agenda, it would just open up the document right there. It doesn't make me save it. Um, you can do, you can have, um, um, you can add emojis to things. So it's got the same you know, you could do lightheartedness, you can send an emoji that you've seen something, you could do googly eyes, um, you can send direct messages to people, you can have different people in different groups. Um, so you may have some people in this Reflections 2020 was like the people that were on the Reflections Committee, including our Reflections Chair. Um, and then we had different people that were set up in the project, you know, logo redesign project. So it's just a different tool. Mm -hmm. Um, again, you have to kind of, you know, this isn't like a everybody try everything, but you sort of have to pick and choose, but it's just another option that's out there. Amani, is there a question? Yeah, so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's that. okay. Um, we have a question on Slack specifically, uh, whether you can make calls through it. Um, making like phone calls through Slack, that might be a feature that you have to pay for. To be honest, I really haven't done that through Slack personally. So I've just used it as more of the, the texting, the messages and the channels that it's been very helpful with. Um, I, I know that if you integrate your Zoom account, you could start a Zoom through Slack. Um, but again, and again, Slack would be something that would not be like association wide. It would really be used by like your board members, right? People that you are, are interacting with on a very frequent basis on different projects and things like that. It wouldn't necessarily be a tool that you would use um, to contact like all of your PTA members, but it would be more, more functional if you were using it as part of a group. Okay, and we have a couple of okay. other uh, questions. Is it like Rema? Yeah. And is it like Remind? So Remind is, um, and I've used Remind a little bit. This is more, I would say it's more robust than Remind because Remind you're using it to like text people reminders. This is more, again, Slack is more of a collaborative tool. It's more give, give and take communication, not just one way communication. It's more, it's more two way, three way, you know, everybody's collaborating together. There's a lot of businesses that use Slack for their, as their, you know, communication platform to do project management and things like that. Um, I've heard of other, I've heard of like private school boards using it to collaborate on different things. So it just, um, I actually started using it when I was part of a MOPS group, our, our leadership team used it to collaborate and work on upcoming meetings and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And uh, two other related questions. Is it similar to Microsoft Teams? And also, do you have to have a Gmail account to use it? No, you don't have to have a Gmail account to use Slack. Um, it's totally independent. 
Um, and is it like, it might be like teams. It might be like teams. I, I haven't used teams a lot. My husband, my husband's an attorney. He's using teams right now for some of his virtual court appearances. So but that's been my, the extent of my personal experience with teams. So, but it's a, it's a collaborative tool. It might be like teams. So I think about these free applications is that, you know, you could try them and see what works best for your yeah. purpose and, you know, See what your team likes best. So. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So Airtable is another tool. Um, this is like a spreadsheet on steroids, kind of. So Airtable is a cloud-based platform. You could add, um, you, you start with like a base, which would be like a spreadsheet, but then you could link it to other spreadsheets. You can add attachments. You could add pictures. You could add, um, you could link it to other spreadsheets. So for example, I used um, Airtable. I, again, I was doing stuff with this MOPS group. I was, I was coordinating the kids. And so I had a table where I had all the list of the kids and their number and their room numbers, but then it also linked, I had the link of their name linked with the, another spreadsheet that had the moms. So you can, you can link them from one to another and, um, you could do this, you could use this for like ref, to coordinate reflections entries, because then you could actually like attach the pictures to Airtable for reflections entries. So there's different, um, it's mobile app available um, and there's different, there's a free version, but then there's also, you get more uh, space, more storage if you pay for it. So again, it's just another tool. I just wanted to put it out there, let you guys make you guys aware um, of Airtable. Zoom, okay. so. Before this year, before pandemic 2020, be honest, how many of you had ever used Zoom? Use your yes, no buttons. Prior to March of 2020, how many people had ever used Zoom? Okay. <laughs> Four people were yes. Okay. Okay, so there was quite a few, quite a few more no's than yeses, but I think we can all agree that Zoom is now, it's, it's in the vernacular, right? And I think a lot of us are feeling more comfortable using Zoom. Um, so when I originally gave this presentation, everybody was like, Zoom, what's that? So Zoom is online meeting platform that we're all getting more and more familiar with. So they do have a free plan that you don't have to pay for um, that you can meet for up to 40 minutes um, and you can host up to hundred people. If you want to upgrade to the pro plan, which I know a lot of units are doing, especially this year, they're getting a pro plan. You can do unlimited meetings for up to hundred participants. Um, and those meetings could be as long as 24 hours. Um, and you get a lot of other, uh, you know, one gigabyte, of cloud recording space. They do offer a discount through TechSoup, but you have to, I think, pay for, it might be nine users. You may have to pay for like nine pro plans to get access to the, it's in the earlier slide. It's, I put, I put it in the earlier slide. So, but there is a, there is a TechSoup um, discount for Zoom if you wanna take advantage of that. But that's if you need like multiple users. Um, and they also have a large meeting plan that if you need more than 100 people, I think it's $50 a month, you have to pay in addition to the $14.99. And then I think that gives you the first step up, I think gives you up to 300 people. Um, or you could pay for the really large meeting add-on, which would give you up to 500 people. Um, so these are some important account settings. Um, you wanna enable the waiting. I encourage people to use the waiting room. Zoom has a waiting room feature, which puts everybody in a digital waiting room. And then you could let, and then the host or co-host could let people in one at a time. Um, you can customize that. Um, my recommendations are to disable, there's, um, there's an option when you're setting up the account to disable, you, it automatically gives everybody the ability to join before host. I recommend disabling that. So that way the host has to be in there first and then people can join you. Otherwise people could just be using your account and you have no idea who's in there. Um, I also encourage people to disable using their personal meeting ID when scheduling a meeting. PMI is your personal meeting ID and it, that's a number that Zoom assigns to you when you create an account. 
and it's set up so that way it would be easy. You would just use the same meeting ID all the time. But I think you, many of you have probably heard stories of people being Zoom bombed. Um, and I will share that I had a PTA event that was Zoom bombed last spring that was very stressful. Um, and so some of my recommendations come from that experience of trying to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, you can enable co-hosts. Um, I encourage people to s limit screen sharing to hosts only and co-hosts. Again, so that way a random person couldn't come in and just share their screen, right? Um, that, ha that, happened, that happened to me when I, uh, my meeting when I got Zoom bombed. Somebody shared their screen and it was very offensive. I had to call the police. Um, I'll just leave it at that, but I, I had to, so disabling that, disabling it so only hosts can share <laughs> takes that uh, takes that ability out of the hands of random people that. Um, Sonia, I sadly remember that like it was yesterday. Yes. We learned a lot with that, unfortunately. We did, we did. Um, um, go ahead, Amani. Yeah, was it a total stranger or an attendee registered for living? People want to know what what is what is Zoom bomb. So you, so you Zoom bomb is when you have an unauthorized person enter your meeting or they disrupt the meeting in some way. So um, and the person and I'll share this on the next slide. But the person got in using the settings that I had set up, and it wasn't strong enough. Is what I is what I discovered. <laughs> Yeah, so. the one thing that's important and when you're using Zoom is that you never want to actually post on social media or a front page of your website, the actual mm -hmm. Zoom link. Yes. So if you're going to set up a Zoom, you have an invitation, you have a link, right? Yep. That link, you don't want to post publicly anywhere because that's how hackers get in. And that's what happened in Sonia's case yep. where, uh, you know, so they, she had a unit that posted this publicly and then anybody in the entire wide world can get in. So if you're going to have Zoom meetings, which we all do now, you're going to send them the link right to your members, to their emails, or put it up in member hubs. So so you're not publicly posting that link somewhere, if that makes sense. Yep. And yes, it is okay, Karen, to post a registration link. We do that at New York State PTA. So if you post, yes. Yeah, so if you post the registration link, then they actually have to go in and register. And then all of the things that Sonia has listed here are things that you want to do to have that double protection. Because yep. then you're likely not going to get that hackers and spam because they're going to have to actually go through the registration process, which is a little bit harder than the general um, the general link. Yep. I, I will share, I'm, let me just get through the next last two things on this slide. So if you want to do meetings and I would encourage people to enable nonverbal feedback as like we've used the thumbs up, we've used the yes, no. Um, you can use the raise hand feature, things like that. Enable meeting reactions, again, getting those reactions. Um, and you can do breakout rooms in Zoom. It's a great feature. Um, so when promoting conducting meetings, create a new meeting ID for each meeting. Don't reuse codes. So keep just create a fresh meeting and that way there's fresh login, fresh passcode for every single meeting. Um, as Kyle mentioned, don't post the link on social media, only send via email or other secure platform. Um, you can use Zoom registration. Um, and I put on here with the auto approval turned off. So what we did before I got Zoom bombed is we posted the link that for people to register on our social media page. And when you set it up and the auto approval is turned on, as soon as that person types in their name and their email address, they automatically get the code. It shows up on the screen as soon as they press register. Okay. So the, what happened was the person, they registered using the name of our principal and then he typed in an email address. I don't even know if it was real or fake because as soon as he pushed register, he got the login information and he was able to get right into the meeting. Um, so I, when I do the Zoom registration, we turn the auto approval turned off the day of the event or a couple hours before the event. So that way people could still register, but I have, to, I have to go into my Zoom account on the web browser and I have to manually approve people and that makes them get the information in their email. So the only way they get it is by the email address that they put on the registration form. 
they don't get the meeting credentials any other way. You don't have to do that the entire time of registration, right? Because if somebody is trying, if somebody has nefarious uh, inclinations, they're not going to plan it like a week before the event. They're going to try it like when the meeting is started, which is what happened to me. So, um, so we, so we do that. And for those people, um, and if you do uh, meetings and you have registration, then you can resend the confirmation meeting from, again, this is from the web browser in your Zoom settings. You can resend the confirmation emails anytime you want to. Um, and so we resend it like 30 minutes or an hour prior to the event. And that way everybody gets the unique link emailed to them again um, as what they're doing. So the uh, I did learn, Kyle, when I was, you had mentioned in an earlier thing that your account sends automatic um email reminders that's only when you have the large meeting or webinar feature for the pro okay. accounts that okay. for the pro accounts that only have up to 100 people you have to manually uh set, resend the confirmation emails it doesn't come automatically um as i tried to do tonight i try to make sure that you open the meeting space at least 15 minutes prior to the start of the event and i like to have a welcome slide with music or without music when people come in just so they've got something to look at again think of it as if you if Virtual meetings are like your regular meetings, right? If you were at a regular meeting, you, you as president or vice president or whoever's running the meeting, you would make sure you were in the meeting space at least 15 minutes ahead of time. You'd make sure the lights were on, the door was unlocked, right? Uh, agendas were on the table. So it's the same thing. You wanna create that same feel in a virtual meeting space. So that, that's my recommendation. Um, if you're having an event that were like an election meeting, and you need to make sure you know who's coming in, you could use that waiting room feature and have everybody in the waiting room and have your secretary or other designated person check people in from the waiting room. So that way you verify that people that are coming in are um, valid PTA members or people that would be able to vote. Okay, so this, um, there was a question that came in earlier. So I created this extra slide on the fly this afternoon. There was some question, uh, somebody asked a question about registering people. So when you create your meeting, um, there is an option to make registration required. And that is how you would set up the reg for, for people to register on Zoom. So you would click this as being required. And then as soon as you do that down here at the bottom, you're gonna have this new section that shows registration, email settings, branding, um, poll, live streaming is only if you set up your account to be able to live stream. But this is where you would set up, you would see who, how many re people were registered for your, had registered for your event. Um, and this has it set to automatically approved. If you had it set as manually approved, you'd, it would tell you manually approved. Um, these are different settings. Whoop, sorry, I pushed that too quick. Um, you can create, you can customize the email that gets sent to people for confirmations. And you do have an opportunity to do some branding on your Zoom registration page. So it tells you that you can upload a banner, you can upload a logo, it gives you the dimensions of what those should be. So if you wanted to have, you know, a, people to register on Zoom, it could be branded with like the picture of your picture or logo of your event, some custom language of what to expect, things like that. Question, Amani? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, when you see me, there's a question. <laughs> um, will only the people in the in, <laughs> in this Zoom, um, hold on, it scrolled down. Hold on, I'm going up to it. Um, will only the people on this Zoom um, be able to watch the recording again after, or can any PTA president in the New York State watch when recording is? It's going to be posted on the website. So it's going to be available to anybody <laughs> that wants to, as if you've got, oh, I wish so-and-so were here. Tell them to go to the website, probably, probably yeah. tomorrow, right, and Kyle? I, probably. <laughs> that's true for all our web, our webinars. They're yeah. available for anyone. To so yeah, we'll have everything up tomorrow. Yep. Okay. So Eventbrite is another, is a, is an, is a online ticketing uh, site that you can use. Um, it has a lot of really good robust features. You can do things as quantity. I first discovered Eventbrite when I was restarting my elementary units after school program and they had done it on paper 
for years. Um, and I wanted to go to an electronic system. I didn't want to have to deal with Susie's mom calling me, why did she get into this club and not that club? Or she wants to be with her friends or whatever. I was able to, so using Eventbrite, I was able to create after school registration that had limited numbers for each club. And I set it to go live at like 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. And it was like, it was like people were trying to get into a rock concert. <laughs> as far as people wanted to get into Minecraft club or they wanted to get into the drama club or whatever. So they signed on at 6.01 on Saturday morning to claim their spot for, for after school clubs. Uh, you can do uh, custom registration. The Eventbrite platform, if your event is free and you are not charging money for it, then you can use the Eventbrite platform for free. If you are charging tickets, then they do have a platform cost um, for, the, they have a payment processing and a platform cost if you are charging tickets. Um, but if it's a free event, then, uh, then Eventbrite is a, is a great site to you. There's, if there's a mobile app, you can do a QR code tickets. You can use your iPad at the school to check in people. We've used it for a, a science fair. Um, we, were we were scanning QR codes. Um, you can set up seating charts if you're trying to do, if you're free, free in the auditorium and you want to designate people to sit in, you know, seats A3 to whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's got that ticket master kind of feel, uh, feel to it uh, that you can use. And, and it's free as long as your event is free. The other nice thing about Eventbrite is you can, you can also use it to schedule online events. So, um, and you can integrate it with your Zoom account. So you could set up and do the registration through Eventbrite. And then you could, you know, have, then people could then get the, the link to Zoom uh, th through the Eventbrite. And you can do email notify, you can send custom email messages to people that are attending different things, different workshops, if they answered, depending on the kind of ticket they bought or the, what group they're in or whatever, you can do a lot of really good, robust reporting. Um, and print name tags and do all that sort of stuff. So it's a really good platform. Okay, so this is uh, just talking about all sorts of different social media stuff. Okay, Buffer. Buffer is a find that I found a couple of years ago. Um, I am all about Facebook. I love Facebook um, and uh, I use it all the time. Twitter, really not so much. Instagram, really, really not so much. <laughs> I am kind of a one platform person, but when I came and became a middle school PTA pres PTSA president, I knew I had to reach the students, right? And the students are not on Facebook. Let's be honest with that. Moms and dads are on Facebook. Not too many students are on Facebook. Students are usually on Twitter or definitely Instagram. So I wanted a way that I could reach them and I found Buffer. So Buffer is a platform that you can do for all sorts of social media stuff. Um, they do have a free plan that you can post on up to three social media accounts um, and you can schedule posts. Um, so I really like Buffer. I, um, so this is, this is what it looks like. And it's, it's empty right now, but uh, again, this is a screenshot that I took from earlier in the day, but you could, what I really like about Buffer is you can, type in here, what would you like to share? You could type in your verbiage, you can add a picture and you can say that you wanna post it to all three platforms and it will post it to all three platforms. So all you have to, so you'd only have to make the post once and then you say you wanna share it to all three platforms and it will share it to all three platforms. You can even decide, you can even queue it, schedule the post so that way you want things to post at like 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., 6 p.m. And you could have different schedules for different platforms and you could just um, fill your queue, right? You can fill up to 10 spots for free. Um, so, so it's a way to sort of be able to do all your social, get all your social media programming on the weekend and then schedule it for when you want it to actually go out or go live. So it, it can be a real time saver, especially if you're not, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get stuff, you know, scheduled and do it ahead of time, 
Um, I'm the person that likes to draft emails at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, but I don't want it to hit people's inboxes until 9am the next morning. So I like that about member hub. So buffer is kind of the same way you can kind of set it and forget it. So you set it, set it, um, generate all your content, schedule it when you want to go out to, you can either schedule it to go in the queue, one of those timetables, or you could push it to share it now and it would share it to those platforms. So that's a really good tool, buffer.com. Canva, how many people have used Canva before? Canva is getting around popularity a little bit. Um, okay, seeing, okay. There's at least eight people. Oh, there's one heart on Canva. Okay, so Canva is great. Canva is, um, I would say, I would call it like an online, um, like desktop publishing or graphic uh, creation tool. So you can use it to create social media posts, Facebook covers, flyers, event programs. Um, they do offer, and this is a hyperlink uh, to the uh, Canva for nonprofits. So you do have to fill out some paperwork. You may have to give them a copy of your letter of determination, but once you're designated as a nonprofit, you get like twice as many like free pieces of graphics and you can resize things and you can create teams. It's a great tool. Canva is a great tool. Um, so you can, yeah, you can, you can upload graphics of like your unit logo. You could upload, you know, diff you could upload different pieces that then you can use, or you can use their graphics. They have all sorts of creative, you know, templates that you can just customize things like that. Um, so it's a Canva is a really, really great tool. This is an example of what I have created in Canva on our region account. So um, I've done social media posts, we've done Facebook covers, we've done different, you know, size ads, you've got one size for the zoom uh, welcome page, you've got one size for the Facebook event page, you've got one size for Instagram, you've got, you know, so you can you can have one design, and then you can resize it to squares or rectangles or whatever dimensions you need for all these different tools and Canva is, is a great way to do that. And again, it's all online. It's all, you can collaborate with other people um, and you can, you know, share designs, copy designs, reuse designs, whatever you need to do. So you can, uh, you can be a rock star uh, graphic artist without being a graphic artist. So royalty free images. So a lot of times when you're doing stuff with social media, you want to find images, right? You don't always want to have, I mean, it's great to have pictures, but sometimes, especially if you're taking, you have to be very careful in when including pictures of, you know, students, um, things like that. So using free images, stock imagery, it can be a great tool to have. And so again, these are all hyper, these logos are all hyperlinked to Pixabay, Unsplash, Wikimedia, Flickr. These are all things that you can use um, online. They're all uh, great tools to find graphics that you need for your communications. Okay, fundraising. So I have, I have a few tools on fundraising. I know we're getting, it's 825. So I'm, I'm going to get through these a little bit. Again, there are hyperlinks to a lot of this stuff. So 32 auctions was a tool that I use. So some schools may do silent auctions. This, we did it in the context of a live uh, pre to live event. So um, we, we did use this for a live auction um, and silent auction. So people could, we uploaded all the images, people could you know bid before the event and then it converted to online, uh, it converted to an in-person uh, event uh, later on. So, um, but you can do, um, you can have 32 auctions collect the money or you can have it set up that they're only you know it's only used for the bidding and then you do you collect the payments offline uh so there's different transaction fees for all that information amazon smile how many people use amazon smile i'm expecting a lot of reactions to this so yes yeah, so amazon smile set up an account and then people can shop with amazon smile and then you get 0.5 percent of the purchase and they send out those deposits on a quarterly basis. Um, so this is the procedure for setting up uh, Amazon Smile account. Some of you may or may not be aware, Amazon Smile now has charity lists. So if you have an Amazon Smile account, you could set up a charity list, which is like, it's like a wish list plus, right? 
So some of you may be familiar with wish list. Charity list means that it's it's you're verified as a charity, and so then you can have you can say we need you know so many of this, so many of this for whatever's going on, and then people can purchase off the list, kind of like a registry, right? So you say we need 10 boxes of, you know, hot cocoa mix, or whatever. We just did a gratitude walk. We were doing hot cocoa and stirs and all that sort of stuff. And people could buy it on the Amazon and then have it shipped directly to the school. Um, so Amazon charity list is an, is an alternative. It's another tool in the tool chest that you can use. Benefit is a, um, it's primarily a mobile app. You can use it to do um, e-gift cards. Um, so, and then what happens is every gift card that gets purchased, there's a rebate and the organization gets the rebate. So they have different, you know, percentages for, you know, Home Depot cards or Burger King cards or Apple gift cards or Amazon cards. Um, and then what's nice about it is people download the mobile app and you create, the organization creates an account that they're a cause. And then people could designate your organization as the cause that they're supporting whenever they use the mobile gift cards. Shop with Script is this similar program to Benefit. Shop with Script does e-gift cards, but they also do physical gift cards. So um, this we do, the middle school unit that I'm a part of, we do this. We only do it in December to take advantage of people getting gift cards for um, the hol you know, they give them as holiday gifts. So, and again, the PTA unit would be the organization that would get a rebate. So I'll give you an example. So one of the things that I really like about Shop with Script is you can get, um, it's called five back, five back Visa gift cards with zero activation fee. That's always the kicker for me when I give those Visa gift cards is you have to pay like the 595, like additional charge on top of the gift card, right? For the activation fee. So the five back gift card that you get from Shop with Script has no activation fee. And the organization makes like a percentage and a half point on the dollar amount of the gift cards. So um, we do it and we typically, we get people to purchase probably about 25, Five hundred to maybe three thousand dollars worth of gift cards, and we end up getting about fifty dollars or so from it. Obviously, the more you sell, the more you get, and it depends on the kinds of cards you get. The Visa gift cards give like the lowest percentage, but you get sometimes where people could buy like an Apple gift card, which would give like a three or four percent discount, or they would give like a, you know, Cheesecake Factory gift card, which would give another percentage. So, but again, you could click on the hyperlink and um, it'll take you to the program and you can see all the different, you know, rebates amount and stuff from there. So again, it's just another fundraising option. Um, okay, so I am part of a wonderful, and I emphasize wonderful team of region directors who are always available to answer any questions that you guys have, not just about maybe this presentation or what kind of tools you can use, but um, how to do anything for your PTA unit. So I really wanted to take just a second to just highlight the region directors. This is only half of the group. I have another slide with the other half. So if you're in Central Hudson, Suffolk, Leatherstocking, Genesee Valley, which is my region here in Rochester, New York, Nassau region or Niagara, these are your region directors. And then if you are in other parts of the state, like Northeastern region, South Central, Southeastern, Taconic, Westchester, East Putnam, or the Western district, these are your region directors. And again, these are like the first phone call that you make when you have a question of how do I do this? Or is this the right thing to do? Or I have an issue or whatever the question is, the first call I would say should be to your region director. And then we will connect you if we need to connect you with Kyle at the office or somebody else, or we need to connect you with um, a specialist, you know, allow us as region directors to be that first point of communication for you guys. So I just really wanted to highlight that. So, and with that. Here, here, because our yeah. RDs are amazing. So make sure you get to know your RD for sure. Yes. And it's 831. I didn't do too bad. There's probably a ton of stuff in the chat. <laughs> We're actually doing pretty well. So please, if you have further questions to Sonia, I, I can't believe you actually know that many applications, <laughs> that many sites. I, I couldn't see. I lost count. I thought I was having a grip on it for a while. And then I was like, 
I can't believe that many exist. Sonia, you are incredible. And this was very informative. And yes, the only way to learn this is to go back to it over and over and use it as a, you know, a guide, use it as a guide to, to, yep. to trying different things. People are uh, amazed and uh, we're getting very positive okay, great. comments in the chat. Um, it's a ton of information. Uh, and, and thank you for doing this uh, amazing presentation for us. And uh, Sonia will be back next week. Thank <laughs> you for agreeing to uh, help us with virtual elections and nominations. Uh, we suggest that you go back to the webinar that our very own uh, Jackie Wilson presented in early January on the procedures of nominations and elections to brush up on your NNE uh, procedures and prepare for next week's, which is how to conduct your elections and even nomination process uh, virtually, which we're, many of our units and councils are dealing with that right now. Uh, in preparation for your spring elections. Uh, Sonia and also Allison St. Louis, another one of our amazing region directors will be co-presenting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so stay tuned for the registration to go out uh, shortly by email. Great, if thanks everybody. And again, don't, yeah, take advantage, go through the hyperlinks and the PDF that's gonna get posted on the website tomorrow. If you have any questions, feel free to you know email me mm -hmm. Um, but again, really, I, I am a true tried and true believer. The only way to learn something is by doing it yourself. So feel free to get in there. Zoom has great support articles. A lot of these tools have great support articles um, that will give you step-by-step -step guidance on how to do something if you have a question. Yes, and if you want to go back and see the webinar, this will be posted by tomorrow along with the ones that are already there. They're under the leaders tab in our nyspta.org website. Um, so Kyle, Kyle will put a link shortly to, uh, that takes you directly to that page. Um, it's again under the leaders tab where you can find all our webinars um, in one place, older ones and more recent ones. And you're getting a lot of thank yous. Okay, great. <laughs> Gratefully so, and, and your willingness to help is unbelievable. Sonia, you're very generous with the information. It's so, so helpful. So please, everybody, you can copy that link and put it in, uh, you can save it on your computer or you can put it in a Word file along with other links in this chat. That's my trick when I'm watching a webinar is to copy and paste the links into a blank page so that I can have them later. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week, Wednesday the 10th at our next webinar. And good night, everybody. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you, Rob, our leadership, leadership development coordinator. Thanks, Kyle, for setting us up and always looking out for us. And we appreciate you all being here tonight. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.